All right, I don't see this recording there. It looks like it is. All right, very good. Well, welcome, welcome to another week of Heartland Success Series. Today is working with buyers. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm going to cover just a few things again about working with buyers. Please use the chat box if you have any questions. That's easier for me to see than it is on the Q&A uh, box. So if you put something in Q&A, I might check that along the way, but uh, there's a good chance I miss it. So the chat box is the best way to go. And I'll keep watching that. That's popping up on my screen as things come in. So uh, please use that. Otherwise, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, last week we had the marketing session and that was recorded as well. And this is being recorded. So this will be up on Heartland's YouTube page. So Heartland Realtor Organization, our YouTube page. So go there to check this out. Next week, we're gonna have working with sellers. And then after that, we're gonna do new member jumpstart, new member orientation class on June 17th. So um, fair housing and antitrust, you're welcome to come join us uh, that if you would like. And then June 24th is gonna, I think, probably be our final webinar series. It seems like we've lost a few people as the market's starting to pick back up. Um, so uh, that one will be on June 24th, the Real Estate 201 Advanced Techniques. So I'm just giving you in that session a couple of little tweaks, a couple of little tips maybe on things you can do working with clients to help uh, convince them they should be working with you if that's what you choose to do. So I think that's going to be a fun one. And again, uh, Real Estate 201 is what I'm calling it. So just a couple of advanced techniques. But today we are talking about working with buyers. So welcome everybody. Make sure this is working here and it's not. There we go. We are going to cover uh, becoming the best just briefly. Are you too new? So we've got some new agents on board here, brand new agents, and I see some veterans too. Uh, but we're going to cover are you too new and, and how I dealt with that when I was a new agent. And then we'll talk a little bit about NAR research and why that might be important to you and maybe some other research, uh, which again, we talked about some of that last week. Miscellaneous, a couple of quick slides on that, and then a couple of scripts. You know, the word scripts, I think, bothers people to some degree. They think that it might be canned, that it might be phony, that it's not um, authentic. I don't view it that way. So when we get there, we'll talk a little bit more about that, and then we'll talk and finish up with close, close, close. So I'm guessing this would be around 45 minutes, but we'll see where we end up. Again, I welcome your questions. Go ahead and use the chat box for questions. So Jared James, I really like following him. He's a real estate agent. Frankly, I don't remember where he's from. I'm thinking Colorado, but I could be wrong. Um, so he has a video. We're not going to watch that here because it's a 15 minute video. Uh, you can watch it on your own, but go Google uh, or search Jared James. He's got a lot of interesting real estate ideas, techniques, coaching uh, experiences for you. So he's available on the internet. Go find him and I would tell you to look at what he has to say. Now the one that I like here uh, that I teach at New Member Orientation is the Are You a Professional uh, one. So in here, in his video on Are You a Professional, what he talks about is football players. So he was watching a football game one time, one Sunday, and he thought to himself, you know, these guys go out in the field and they're playing football. What are they doing the rest of the week? You know, and he knows, of course, they're practicing, but what are they practicing? I mean, they already know how to throw the ball, they know how to catch the ball, they know how to run. What exactly is it that they're practicing if they already knew, know how to do these things, they're already professionals. By the time they make it to the NFL, clearly they played probably in high school, probably in college, and now, you know, being taught by the best there are. Why would they need to practice five days before a game or six days or whatever it is they practice? And his point is very clear in that, because you need the repetition, you need that muscle memorization, that muscle memory to make sure that those muscles throw them. And when the quarterback throws the ball, that's perfectly placed in the receiver's arms or hands so he can get, catch that ball and keep running or go or score the touchdown or whatever their goal is on that play. Um, so re repetition is important. And why I think it's important for you here is the point that I like to make with this one is, I think it's important for you to practice. Now, some of you, again, on this call are veteran agents, and maybe you've already done enough practicing that this already flows off your tongue, but some of you are not. Some of you, again, are brand new, and I think it's very important for you to take that time to do the practicing before you go live with a real client that you get ready for it, that you prepare yourself for the what ifs. What if you're on an appointment and a client says something to you that's... Uh, um, antitrust or fair housing issues? How are you going to respond to it? You need to think about these questions before they come your way. I was working with a client one time. And this is, I, I used to sell real estate a long time ago before I moved to the association side. So I often draw back from those experiences. I was a full-time agent. My sole source of income wasn't married, didn't have another. My parents had already gone. So, you know, it was sell homes or go hungry. 
So I remember that clearly, and it was you know a passion of mine to make sure I was helping my client. So I'm out with a client. She was buying a, a nice townhouse. Uh, we're there, I think, I don't think it was a walkthrough, but her father had come with, and we're standing in the driveway of the property. He looks out over the green space behind, you know, in the middle of the units, and he says, what kind of people live here? I, I think I know what he meant, and I think it was a, you know, racist kind of question. Um, I don't know that for sure. She jumped in and said, oh, dad, stop it. People live everywhere. And I thought, wow, I wasn't ready for that question. So it's those kinds of things. That's what Jared makes me think of in his Are You Professional? You need to practice what you're going to say. You need to practice your scripts. You need to practice what you're going to say in these appointments so that when you get into those situations, you know how you're going to handle it and you, you're smooth about it. All right. Um, I don't have this uh, for you, but Eight Essential Skills was published in Inc.com. So it's not even a real estate magazine. This was a number of years ago. But they talk about eight essential skills and how to sell. And I want to be real clear. I'm not so sure that real estate agents are in the selling business of selling homes. I think you're in the service business of helping people buy homes. Even if you're on the seller side, really you're helping that transaction come together. You're not pushing a product. You know, these people didn't call you in or call you up because they didn't want a product. They do want it. They want to buy or they want to sell. They're just scared and timid about it. And you need to help them through that uncomfortable part. It is scary. I mean, it's a huge transaction, packing up, moving, going somewhere else. They're always asking themselves, am I doing the right thing? Is this the right time? Should I be doing this now? Is this the right amount of money? All the different factors that come into it. Should I stay where I'm at? Should I keep renting for now? All those things. They're just scared. You need to help them through it. So I don't think it's really selling them on something. To me, selling makes it sound like you're pushing a product, and I don't think you're pushing product. I think you're helping people do what they're looking to accomplish and meet their goals and achieve greatness. I mean, we know that home wealth is the way that people grow their wealth um, exponentially. So this Inc.com magazine talks about research topics, and then planning meetings, creating rapport, asking questions, Listen actively, presenting solutions, asking for commitment, and building relationships. Sort of the eight-step process to how to consummate the sale, if you will. So the research, you're doing that today. You're getting educated. You're learning the market. You're learning how to do real estate. Um, you know the inventory that's out there. You're planning your meeting. You're going to set up for the, the meeting with the client, whether it's a buyer client like we're talking today or even a seller client. And then in my opinion, number three and number five are the biggest ones. You need to create rapport. Oftentimes your clients, buyers or sellers often become lifelong friends of yours. You know, I haven't sold real estate, I don't know, 15, almost 20 years. Um, there's still people that I sold homes to that I helped with real estate that I still interact with today. They're good friends of mine uh, because of real estate. So you will grow a connection with some of these people that will extend for very long periods of time. Creating rapport is a huge piece of that transaction and a part of the relationship. Asking questions, of course, goes into the building rapport and also to listening, act, listening actively. You need to actively hear what they're saying and responding to it. You know, if somebody says $200,000 is my price range, you need to find out, is that roughly where they want to be or they can't go past $200,000? It's a huge thing to know exactly what that means because in that price range, especially here in McHenry County, 210,000 might get them a, a bit more house than they were looking for at 190. So it could be a big factor in meeting their goals, but if they are clear that they don't wanna go past 200,000, then you need to respect that. So that's just one piece of listening actively, hearing what they're saying. Um, you know, I think of a different client than I had of mine, uh, John, John was a tailor. His shop, his tailor shop was in the same strip mall as my office. So he was looking to buy a property he had just moved his tailor shop from one town to our town and wanted to move his house to be much closer to work because he was driving now almost an hour each way. And that was great. I went to work with John and asked him what his goals were. And he said, I want to be within 30 minutes of my shop. I said, great, John, we can do that. So I'm looking for all these properties, trying to find it for him, work with him. It seems to me like it was months, of course, now looking back, but really it ended up he bought the pro a property from another real estate agent. Of course, I was heartbroken. So I went to him one day over to his shop and say, hey, John, how you doing? I know you bought a house, no problem, I understand. Just tell me what I did wrong, what was it? You know, you said, and you know, where did you buy a house? So he names the town, and the town is an hour away. And I thought, he, he doesn't know, you know, how far he's driving or, or what it was, but 
I was actively listening to him, but what I didn't hear was what was more important to him wasn't the distance, it was what the home features were. So I made the mistake, I don't blame John, I blame myself. I didn't listen well enough to what was truly important to him in his scenario. So listening actively. Of course, presenting solutions. So maybe I should have questioned John a little bit more. If when he said 30 minutes, maybe I should have said, great, I hear your 30 minutes. Is it a hard 30 minutes? Or what if I find the house that's got everything you're looking for, but it's 45 minutes away? Would that be something you would consider? Good question, right? I didn't do that then. I was a little bit younger at that point, didn't have all this uh, information I have now. So ask those things, find out from them what's important and where, what pieces are most important for them. Asking for a commitment. You know, this part, uh, again, the, the article comes from a non-real estate perspective, but I think this is important for us as real estate agents because there are clients, there are people, the public, who think they need to work with multiple real estate agents, especially on the buy side. Obviously, you can't both list the same home. Uh, on the buy side, to work with multiple agents or to see the entire market, to know exactly what's going on in the marketplace, to know all the properties available. You and I know that that's not true, that you have access to the MLS and most importantly, you have access to the PLN, the Private Listing Network. That's an important part of MRED and our MLS. I hope you know that if you, know, if you aren't familiar with it, I don't have time right now to go over the PLN, but you need to find out more about the PLN because I know for a fact, I had a phone call this morning about properties that are selling while they're in the PLN, the Private Listing Network side of the MLS before they go public and everybody gets to see it. So if you're working with the buyer, you need to be watching the PLN for properties that meet their needs so you can take care of their, their needs and their transactions. So asking for a commitment, asking them, are you committed to working with me? Just like I'm going to be committed to working with you. And we're going to get to the buyer agency agreement in a couple minutes, but that's what that commitment does. And then of course, through all this, you're building a relationship. So are you too new? So jumping right into it. So um, I know there's a couple on here that are brand, brand new. So if you feel like you're too new, Kevin Ward has a video. It's a 15 minute video as well. So he talks here about having energy market knowledge, partnering with success, developing skills fast and studying success. Those are ways for you to quickly build your confidence in my opinion. And I absolutely agree with that. So take a look, look up that Kevin Ward video. I don't remember the name of that one, but um, you could probably find that pretty easily. And then uh, another one, another real estate agent says about knowing the, the, knowing the new rules. So real estate has changed, have those other agents changed? So what her comment was is, so if someone says to you, well, how, how new are you in real estate or how long have you been in real estate? Um, obviously respond, you can't lie to them, give them the answer. And if they say, oh, and there's some sort of hesitation or some issue with that, you may wanna come back and say, well, what is it about that that bothers you? You see, I've been in real estate a long time and we're gonna to get to this answer in just a second here. So, um, so feeling like you're too new. First, my first response, this is my personal one, don't make them ask you. That was my issue. I was 28 years old, 25 years old when I got into real estate. So um, I was really young. And when I would go out on an appointment, yes, I owned my own home, but I really had no other experience in real estate other than that one transaction of buying my, my condo, my town home. Um, what I found was anytime someone asked me how long I'd been in real estate, it was always precipitated, always precipitated by something that I said. I brought them, I led them to that question. So I would say something like, oh, when I was in the bank, when I worked at the bank, and they're like, oh, you worked at the bank, how long have you been in real estate? I'd bring them to it. And there were a couple of times where I was first brand new at this, and I'd be on a listing appointment or working with the buyer, and I'd be saying something, and I could almost see the words coming out of my mouth. Oh, when I worked at the bank, like I want to grab them and put them back in, but it's too late. And you know the next question they're going to ask after you say that is, oh, how long have you been in real estate? And there's nothing wrong with it. You shouldn't be scared of the question. That doesn't mean they're gonna leave you, but you may not want them asking that question if you're afraid of answering that, that answer, giving that answer. So first response is don't make them ask you. Don't follow them down that path. Don't give them the hook. Don't talk about anything else you've ever done. Pretend like when the day you were born, you had a real estate badge on. You were in real estate from the second you came out. So. Um, that will help alone. They're going to assume you've been in real estate a long time unless you tell them otherwise or you give them some information otherwise. Next, you, don't, you need to make sure, you need to believe that it doesn't matter. And that's back to Kevin's point of the confidence thing. Absolutely. And it doesn't matter. <clears throat> it really doesn't matter how long you've been in real estate. It matters how confident you are, 
how comfortable you are in your position, if you know what you're doing and you've got skills and teams. So you might answer it with something like, granted, I'm fairly new, but I spent years in customer service and that's really what real estate is all about. Property is just the product we sell. Say that almost just like I said it, maybe a little bit better. Say it like it is, say it factually, say it confidently, and get back to what you're doing, get back in that conversation you were having. Get off that new topic, and they will, they will stay with you on that. If it's an issue for them, then they'll bring it back up, but most likely, once you deal with it once, you're done. Give them that answer, it's one sentence long, it's a long sentence, but give them that one sentence long, and be done with it. Move back on, and you're off of it, you've dealt with it, you put it behind you, and it's over. Or you could come up with an answer like this one. Sure, I'm new to the XYZ team, but I've got great mentors and a full support team behind me. Most importantly, I'm eager and committed to you. Let's get the papers ready. Closing, you always gotta be closing. And we're gonna end the session today with that. So something like that. But again, say it with confidence. Say it like it doesn't matter. Most importantly, like it says, believe that it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter that you're brand new. You've got a support team, whether that's your managing broker in your office or you're relying on Heartland to help you in some ways. You've got the information you need to be successful in real estate. Just go out there and do it. All right, NAR research. Um, so there are a whole bunch of things that NAR puts out, and this one is the 2018. They haven't updated the 2020 yet. That will come out next, you know, come out shortly, I would imagine, but they're working on it. So the 2020 guide will come out soon. From the 2018 NAR Home Buyers and Sellers Guide. It's 150 pages long. It's produced by NAR with facts and figures about market trends of buyers and sellers. Available for, for, for a fee at NAR.realtor, not free for a fee, like it says, um, or check it out for free from Heartland's library. So we do have a copy here at Heartland's library, or if you want to take a browse at it, let me know and I can probably uh, figure some way to get that to you since we're technically closed with, uh, you know, today. Um, so what does it say in there? Why is this important to you? So some of the things that it covers, these were just some of the topic, the uh, chapter headings, characteristics of buyers, that's important to you. Characteristics of homes purchased, that's important to you. The home search process, mm -hmm. home buying the real estate professional, that's key. Financing the home, so all these kinds of facts about what these buyers are doing, how they're buying properties. In this case, how many of them bought cash, how many got financing, that kind of thing. Sellers and their experience, home selling in the real estate professional and for sale by owners all important factors for you. And again, next week we're gonna cover working with sellers. So in there, uh, here's a slide, I meant to update this so you can see a little bit better, but you get the idea. And then I think I've got on the next page too. Um, so 4.2 or, or exhibit 4.2, you can see in here all buyers, and then it breaks it down to Northeast, Midwest, South and West. And maybe you can't see this too well, but it says uh, method of home purchase by region through a real estate agent or broker, directly from builder or buyers or builder's agent, directly from the previous owner, knew the previous owner, did not know the previous owner. So directly from previous owner had two options below it. Um, so through a real estate agent in the Midwest, 85%. Pretty sure that's what that number is, even though when you add up the others, it doesn't add up to 100, so I don't know how that works. But 85% um, of the people who bought homes bought through a real estate agent. That's a good sign. That means they recognize that they need someone to help them in, in this transaction, so. Um, also in 4.8, 4-8, it says what buyers want most from a real estate agent. You think that's important? Oh yeah, right? Because you need to figure out how to get clients to want to work with you. So what's most important to them? Here we go. In order, help find the right home to purchase, 52%. Only 52%. I'm surprised that's not higher, but what's the reality? The reality is they can go online today and lots of portals, lots of websites and avenues for them to look up the housing information on their own to start that process. So 52% wanna find the right home to purchase and that's why they call the real estate agent. But more importantly, I think, is what else is there involved? Because I think that's the one we all think of as the most uh, ideal reason people call us. Help buyer negotiate the terms of the sale. We're gonna come back to that in a minute. Um, so negotiating, 14%. Help with the price negotiations, 11%. Help with paperwork, 6%. Determine what comparable homes are selling for, 6 Help determining how much more uh, home, how much home buyer can afford, 4%. Of course, we have lenders for that, but you are involved in that. You are a part of, as their agent, you are a part of building that, I don't wanna say team, because we're not allowed to use that word anymore, but building your uh, group of affiliate members. So your home inspectors, the attorneys, the lenders, the photographers, the home warranty people, home inspectors, all of them, all of those people, you are the captain of that group. 
So you need to be the one there. And of course, financing for a buyer, there's nothing more critical than that, right? Help and arrange financing. Help teach the buyer more about the neighborhood or area, restaurants, parks, public transportation. So of course, you have to be careful with that. We always train, you're never the source of the information. You're always the source of the source. So someone says, well, what's the population of McHenry County? You would say, oh, you can go to McHenry County's website and they have that information. Or you can go to the Census Bureau and find that information, but you never give them, oh, we're 315,000 people roughly. Because once you give any information out, now you've guaranteed it. So what if they don't like 315,000, they want to know that we're really 312,000. I don't even know what it is, it's three somewhere, somewhere in that range. But be careful about giving out information, always be the source of the source not the source of the information. Help find renters uh, for buyer's property, less than 1%. So those are some of the things that are important to you. That's why it's important to flip through that NER magazine uh, brochure, or that, that booklet, uh, 150 pages with all those different criteria to figure out exactly how you're gonna hone down, how you're gonna work with and, and identify buyers to, for yourself. Some other things, work with buyers. Use the MRED tool. So you've got a very, very robust MLS. I'm proud that I sit on MRED's board of directors and we do a lot of things to make sure that that MLS stays very robust for you. And for your minimal fee, roughly $25 a month, you are getting a lot of different tools. I mean, I, I can't even imagine where else you can pay a fee of that, that size to get access to all the different tools. I mean, there's gonna be 24, 25 different programs within MRED that are available to you. So utilize those. Take the online training programs, um, get a hold of the classes. They're, they've got webinars on them. There's online uh, video tutorials for you to watch as well. Get to learn all the things that are in there with, through MRED and the tools. Search recently rented properties is one thing. That's a good idea, right? Nine months ago. So who recently rented a property at around nine months? Is that tenant ready to start looking to move to a property? So maybe that's some, a way you can, and that's, you can find that through Remind, by the way. So Remind's got a lot of valuable tools. Remind recently replaced Realist for our tax database system, but Remind has a whole robust amount of other things as a part of it. So the tax database is one small piece or feature of it, um, but there's a whole lot of other things that you can do in Remind. So you need to learn a lot more about Remind and what it offers. Um, all right, learn and use Remind, prospecting tools. So prospecting, of course, you're gonna take your buyer information, you're gonna put it into the system. So it can be either through Connect, which is MRED system, or some of your franchises also offer uh, systems that you can input your buyer information into, and it will search the MLS and then send them information on the homes that are available. Put it into a system. MRED is there for you in case your firm doesn't have one for you, and it's a great system. But if your firm has one, then you probably want to be using your firm system for a lot of the other connectivity things that uh, also filter into it. So keep that in mind. And then that's prospecting. So you're going to take your clients, put them into the MLS, into the system, put their criteria in, select how frequently you want the system to email them, and it will email them information about the new listings that meet their criteria on that frequency that you've selected. Reverse of that, there's two other things is, um, well, we're just gonna cover the one here. Enter your own name in the system. So as a buyer's agent, you need to be aware of, and a seller's agent, you need to be aware of what properties are on the market especially if you're farming an area, and that's a seller technique, but if you're farming an area for new listings, or if you have clients that you normally work in a certain area as a buyer's agent, I did a lot of condominiums. I did an awful lot of condominiums in Vernon Hills when I was an agent. Um, so I needed to know all of the inventory that was for sale. So when a new listing came on, if it was listed by another agent, I made sure I went out to see that uh, property on broker tour day, or if I missed a broker tour, if they didn't have one, I'd set up a preview appointment and go out and look at it myself. You need to know all of the property in the area that you're working so you're familiar with it. So when a client calls you up and says, hey, I'm looking for a condo in Vernon Hills, you can say, great, I know three. One just came on yesterday and I've already seen it and it's a great property. What are you looking for? Let me see if we can get you out there, right? You need to be the expert. You need to know it. You can't just say, oh, I saw that one came on yesterday. No, it needs to be, I saw one came on and I've seen it and it's a great property. I think you should come on, take a look at it or whatever the conversation is. But by entering your own name in the system for a search, Put in the areas that you work into the system so that it emails you on a daily basis every morning, 5 a.m., whatever time works for you, it emails you all the properties that came on the day before. 
that are in your area so that you can be aware that there's a new listing. You might have a buyer who's looking in the Plymouth Farm subdivision. A new listing comes on, it, it pings you in the next morning and sends you the information. You can pick up the phone, call your buyer and say, hey, look, a new property just came on the market in Plymouth Farms. So we gotta get over and take a look at it before the thing sells, right? Yes. So currently in McHenry County, we have a little bit of a divergent market. We've got the upper level market that's not moving quite as well. We've got the lower level market that's running away. It's fast. Um, we have currently a 2.9 month supply of inventory in the county, meaning if homes keep coming on the market at, at the same rate they're coming on, if we keep selling them at the rate we're selling them, this is also known as the absorption rate, we have 2.9 months before we run out of homes. Now we're never really gonna run out of homes, but that's a gauge for how much property we have you know, listings available. So you need to be aware of where we're at. So 2.9 months, by the way, I believe four is a balanced market here in McHenry County. NAR says that six months is a balanced market for the nation. Not here, I think four is a balanced market in McHenry County. That's 20 something years of doing real estate telling you that. So we're at 2.9, meaning on the low end, this is a seller's market. Now keep in mind, if we have the upper end that's not doing well, and the low end that's doing extremely well, fast selling homes, and 2.9 is the average, that means this upper market has pulled that number even higher than it would be. If you've got a first time home buyer, I don't know, I didn't do the stats on it, but the, the market uh, month supply of inventory in that market's probably one, I'm guessing. And this is probably six, right? And that average is almost three. So um, think about that. Think about what your clients have worked with. Put your name in the system so that you know what properties are on the market and what's become available to you. You can go see. All right, scripts. Again, some people have an issue with scripts, think that, oh, I'm talking to somebody into doing something that they don't want to do. They do want to buy a home. That's why they called you. They are interested. You're not convincing them to do anything they didn't already want to do. You just need to help them overcome some of the obstacles in their own minds, some of their own fears, their anxieties, buyer's remorse, we call it, right? Right after they sign the contract and get ready to close or you know, sign the contract, and now they're, they got the attorney's approval and home inspection period. That next morning, they wake up with this fear and anxiety of, oh my God, what are we doing? Are we buying a house? We're spending $100,000, $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 on property. There's an anxiety, right? There's a little remorse with that. That's very normal. You need to be there as the voice of reason to help them, help comfort them and ask them, well, what's, what's making you scared? What part of this is scary for you? Oh, I'm afraid that I'm gonna lose my job. Oh, okay, well, is there a real serious uh, concerned about that? Is that likely to happen? Well, no, but what if? So, right? Or what if they say, yeah, it's very likely I could lose my job. Well, then maybe they shouldn't be buying a home. So you need to ask those questions, almost like a, a social worker, to figure out where they're at in their livelihood, their lifestyle, and whether this makes sense for them or not. So again, I, I don't think scripts is a bad term. I don't think we're convincing them to do anything they, they don't want to be doing, but it's a way for you to make sure you have responses to help them overcome their anxieties. So one of the scripts I think you should have, one of the conversations at least, maybe we should just call it conversations, um, you should have with your buyers is I need to ask you a few questions before we get started. You see, I need to take your temperature, so to speak. How soon are you looking to make a move? And then find out their motivation. That's really, really critical for you. Is there a real desire to move or is there not? Oh, well, I wanna get my kids into the high school over there before the high school starts. Oh, well, how old are your kids? Oh, they're in third grade. Okay, we've got a little time. Oh, they're eighth graders that just graduated. Okay, we better get a move on because we're already behind the clock, right? So find the motivation, find out their timing. What is it? Um, you know, grandparents. Oh, we've got a grandchild being born down in Florida. We want to get down there before the grandchild's born. Great. How far along is your daughter-in-law or your daughter, right? Um, oh, she's one month. Okay, we've got a little bit of time. Oh, she's eight months. We got to get moving. You're going to miss this. So find their motivation, figure out, ask the questions, get to know what the important pieces are. I call it their hot point, find out their hot point. So hot buyer dialogues, the next slide. This is a little bit longer conversation. You don't have to memorize any of these word for word, by the way, you need to have the idea behind them. So uh, if they're hot, then I have found that I'm only able to work with about five buyer clients at a time properly. I need to be able to devote myself to working with you and getting you in the properties that fit your needs on your schedule. When a property comes in the market that's ideal for you, we'll have to ask, act fast to ensure that you can see it, 
and then, the, then you buy the one that's perfect for you. I'm currently working with three hot buyers right now, so I have room for you on my schedule. But if you're not ready to buy within the next two months, we'll need to take another approach until you're within that time frame. I can certainly set you up an automated feed of properties that meet your needs and follow up every two weeks or so. But I want, but what I need to know is uh, where you're in the process, because once this happens, it happens fast. Are you ready to become my fourth buyer client? Now, if you're gonna use this, you have to be truthful. You can't say five buyer clients at a time that you only work with five if you work with more than that. So tweak this as you need to, but you can, you can tweak this conversation to fit your style, your, your delivery, if you will. But it's important for them to understand that you are devoting to them, they need to, to devote to you. And then of course, if they're ready to become a buyer client, then you need to ask some other questions. Um, so the okay to buy dialogue. All right, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, if I do my job right, and I hear uh, what you say you are looking for, it's very likely that the best home for you will be within, the, within one of the first five we see. You need to understand that it's okay to buy one of those homes because we've both done a good job of communicating and listening to each other. On the other hand, I'm happy to show you 10 or 15 or more homes, you're setting the expectation, um, to help you find the home that's right for you. So before we start looking homes, I need to know, are you ready to buy? If we find the right house for you, will you be ready to put in an offer and get moving? And then wait. I love this script. I use this one with my clients. There's several things in here that, that hit home for me. So first of all, right in the first sentence, you're kind of setting them up for, we don't have to go look at 50, 60, 80, 100 homes. We're going to go do five, maybe 10. You're setting the expectation that if you do your job right as the buyer and you tell me what's really important to you, and if I do my job right as the buyer's agent and I find out what's really important to you, like John, who said 30 minute drive, but really ended up moving almost an hour away, uh, find out what's really important to him, to your client. So set this up because the truth is you go into the computer system, you put in the proper criteria, whatever that is, the most important criteria, the cream of the crop will rise. Yes, you'll get 20 responses, but then you're gonna go back through there and delete the ones that aren't quite what they're looking for because it doesn't have this or that, or it has something they don't want, or it's too far away or, or whatever it is. So you're gonna get the, the group and then whittle that down. So, but you need to make sure they're comfortable with working and understand they can buy a home within the first five or six or 10 that they see and be comfortable with that. Because I think too many people, a lot of people maybe, a lot of people, We'll go look at properties, find one they absolutely love. My best friend just called me on this and said, oh yeah, he and his family found one, they love it. They wanted to go see more and guess what happened? That first house sold. And now every house they go to, they compare to that first one. They can't get that first one. It's done and gone. They should have bought it. I'm not blaming the agent, I'm not blaming them. This is just the emotions that go with it. But that happens too frequently and you need to help your clients understand that if we find the right house for you, you need to be ready to go. You need to be ready to move. And that's the last sentence. So before we start looking at homes, I need to know, are you ready to buy? And then I never, I, I always like to hit them with the two questions. You know, when you ask someone the question the first time, they almost think of it on a high level and don't give it the depth that the questions have. And I talk about this, I will talk about this next week in the seller session, I believe. Uh, we cover a little bit in the marketing as well. Checking with them. So, you know, you're walking through the home in a listing presentation. You say, do you have any guns in the home? They say, no, you need to come back to the second question of, so you have no guns, knives, uh, air guns, pistol, uh, pellet guns, BB guns, no guns at all. Oh, well, I've got a pellet gun, right. So the first question, they think a very high level. Then you bring it back for a second question and they think about it in depth. Here's that point on the buyer side. Again, so before we start looking at homes, I need to know, are you ready to buy? You see, if we find the right house for you, will you be ready to put in an offer and get moving? And then I would even add to that, I think it might be the next slide. Um, because once this process starts, it happens fast, and we can have you in a new house in less than two months. So here it is, the beginning of June. Are you ready to be in the house at the end of July or early August? Stop, pause, let it sink in. Let them look at each other. Let them hear it, feel it, absorb it. Use silence as your, your friend here. Once we get started, once you put an offer in, we'll have this done in about 60 days probably in 30 to 45 days, frankly, but I'm gonna give us ourselves about a, a week or two for us to find your property. Are you ready to be moved into a home by the end of July, or early August? 
and look at them. Just wait. Don't say anything. Don't break the silence. So you are very good. See how I'm nodding? If you want them to say yes, then you nod with them. That's a little extra trick I won't go through with you. Um, over too hard. All right, so here we go. Have you met with a lender and gotten pre-qualified? Then probably, they'll probably answer yes. So again, that second question thing. So here, pre-qualified is the word I used. You and I know that pre-qualified is not what we want. We want pre-approved. They don't know the difference and that's okay that they don't know the difference. For them, it's all one thing. It just means have we talked to a lender? So you're going to say, have you met with a lender and gotten pre-approved or pre-qualified? Doesn't matter in this sentence. So have you met with a lender and gotten pre-qualified? Yes. Oh, follow up with the second question. Oh, you have, great. So you've gotten them your tax returns, W-2s, and all that other information they've asked for? Wait, pause. No, they didn't, right? Because most of them don't. Okay, great, not a problem. How soon do you think you're gonna be able to get that over to your lender? And by the way, what's the name of your lender again? And write that down, of course, because now you're gonna follow up that lender as well, right? All right, so I need you to copy that pre-approval letter, submit with your offer. As soon as you get that to me, we can start seeing properties. What? How many people have you done that to? Hopefully, I know there's some veterans on this call, hopefully some of you have, you are not showing property without a pre-approval letter. You need one, especially in this hot market on the low end of properties right now, every seller, a seller's agent is gonna require a pre-approval letter. So you need to have one with your buyers. Okay, so if they say no, they haven't gotten the pre-approval, but they still wanna go see properties anyway, because that's what's gonna happen in a lot of times. Um, so then you can come back with this one. And if you want to copy these slides, of course, they're going to be on our YouTube page with this program or send me an email and I'd be happy to send them to you. So here's the, the script. Oh, so you want to go see properties before you have your paperwork ready. Let's think of it this way. Would you like to see homes that might come on the market for sale or homes that are on the market for sale? Right, of course. You want the seller to be serious. Makes sense. But that's what they're asking of you. People they let into their homes need to actually be ready to buy a home, not just wanting to be ready to buy a home. Let me have a member of my team give you a call to get you pre-approved quickly. Would you prefer XYZ company or ABC company? Give them two options, not a whole bunch. Don't say, well, let me know when your lender, you need to get a hold of the lender. Pin them down, use people on your team, use your affiliate partners, get them out there. You should have two or three affiliates that are your, your buddies. We covered this a little bit last week in the marketing session. Have a couple of them that are your, your, your go-to people and um, give those out here. So how soon do you think you're gonna be able to have that done? When can you call them? You can call them tonight? No? In fact, I'll have my person give you a call. What's a good time? You guys available tonight to give a, you know, a conversation? And then how quickly can you have the documents over? Pin them down. If they want this to happen, if, again, we talk about that motivation, if they need to get to down to sunny Florida to go see the granddaughter being born, the clock's ticking. And as we just went through the other thing, so if they want to get their kid into the high school, if they buy right now, they start this process, we're talking end of July, early August. They're already behind the eight ball with trying to get this process done. There's still a little bit of time, but if they wait, procrastinate at all, they will not be into that house in time to get their kid registered for the high school that they want. It's important. So press on that a little bit. So if they say, oh, well, we're busy tonight, you say, great, I understand that, but I'm just concerned for you. You have your goals of wanting to be into this new property before the school year starts. And right now as it sits, it's about a 60-day window to make this all happen. You're already kind of pushing this a little bit. It's gonna be difficult. That gives us even a little less time to go out and look at properties that are available for sale for you. And I wanna be sure we get the right home for you. So I really need you, in fact, you need you to get on top of getting this lender pre-qualification done quickly. Do you think you might have a few minutes tonight I can have someone give you a call? I'm using a name there. All right, um, close, close, close. So you've got to ask for the close. So this is a little easier on the seller side, but even in there, as you just heard, we're going in for the close. You've got to, I don't want to say beat it up, but you've got to help your clients understand the importance of the timeline, to understand that there is a finality to this that you're not gonna just go around and look at all at homes with them for the rest of their lives the next year. That's not the point here. And it is okay for you, it is okay, see I'm doing this with you now, it is okay for you, as I nod my head, for you to say to them, by the way, I'm on commission, I get paid nothing for my time, my efforts, this conversation we're having right here, I get paid nothing for it unless or until you buy a property. I'm not gonna force you through anything, but on the other side is, I don't have time to just give away. I need to make a living to pay for my family's needs, my home, all those other things as well. So 
I'm not saying you should do that with every client. That's a bit pushy, frankly. But there are some clients where you're going to get to the point where you're going to need to have that uh, kind of heart to heart conversation with them. And it's okay to remind them that you get paid strictly on commission. I remember uh, a couple of mine, Matt and um, Dawn, who we had just closed on the property. I helped them sell their, their townhouse and they bought a, a beautiful home in Gross Point Village in Vernon Hills. We were going over to a bar because these people became good friends of mine. We we're going over to a bar. We we're all the same age back then, probably about 30 years old, uh, going to a bar to celebrate. And he said, Matt looks at me and says, hey, what are you going to do with that bonus check? And I looked at Matt and said, oh, that wasn't a bonus check. I finally got paid for all the work I put in. And he's like, oh my God, I forgot. You're 100% commission." They don't think about it. And these are people I got along with really extremely well, knew them for several months. Um, you know, obviously you hung out a little bit. So they don't, they don't get that. Most of the public doesn't realize what a 100% commission job feels like, looks like, how it is. It's okay to help them, to mention that to them. I wouldn't hit them over the head with it, but in an appropriate conversation, have the conversation with them. So that's one technique for the close of, here's the timeline, when do you think you're gonna get serious without being that bold? So close, 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 close three times, close again, and then the seller side, keep closing until they kick you out. Seriously, you need to be selling property. This is not a community service, because that's the word I always use for it. The clients that you have that you do a lot of work with, and then they end up buying through somebody else, like that guy, John, I mentioned, that was a lot of community service I gave to him, right? I get paid nothing for that. So. All right, one other piece, since we've got a little bit of time here, I'm a little bit ahead. Working with family. So I covered this again last week uh, briefly in the sphere of influence. So I want you to think about how you're gonna work with your own family. One thing that I did very poorly and didn't realize until I kind of left the sales side of real estate to come to this side, is when people ask you, you, you go to the family reunion, you see your friends, your family, and they ask you, oh, how are you doing in real estate? The worst answer, that I kept giving all the time was, it's great, thanks for asking. When the real answer should have been, hey, I'm doing pretty well, but I can always use a couple more deals. So if you know someone that might be looking to buy or sell a home, I could really use the assistance. So if you've got a name with someone, I'd love it if you'd pass along to me. I could really use some help. See the head nodding? That, that's good. That puts in their mind of, yes, I'm gonna help Jim. I'm gonna give him a name as soon as I have one. Do you know of anybody, by the way, Go ahead and ask. They might, they might have someone, right? So think about it from that way. Um, I did not like to work with family, especially close family. That said, my best friend did buy, a different best friend, did buy uh, a house from me. He was my first transaction. He and his wife bought a beautiful home from a builder. I was two and a half weeks into real estate and got them under contract with a builder. That was a great thing. Nice home, good, nice to get a commission started right early in my process. But most family did not get along with terribly well in the way of working for them directly. This is just me. I'm not saying you should not work with them. The issue I had, I'm thinking of my Aunt Kay. I love her. She's gone now. Um, however, my mom's best friend, my mom's been gone a really long time. My mom's best friend, my Aunt Kay, was looking to buy a property. It was close enough to the area that I worked that I could have actually helped her, right? Easily helped her. She bought using another real estate agent. That hurt me. And then I realized the problem is not with me. She loved me. She, she, you know, that wasn't it. The issue was she didn't want me to know about her income and her finances. And she was more uh, protective of that than it was our relationship. So back to my point of working with family and friends, maybe your close family and friends, you want to work with them to try to get those referrals, as I mentioned, instead of directly working with them, perhaps, maybe they're, uncomfortable working with you, perhaps, because of the intimacy of the information, that's very possible. So don't take it too personally if they don't want to use you. It's probably their own insecurity and their own information. Maybe they have a bankruptcy or foreclosure or something they don't want you to be aware of. That could be a factor. So take that into consideration, but work them for those leads. And again, when someone says, oh, how are you doing in real estate? Don't come back with the simple answer of, oh, I'm doing great. Unless, of course, you really don't want any other business. I don't know any agents that are in that category. Um, last uh, story, and I'll wrap it up here. So my, uh, that, my friend's sister-in-law was using me to buy a property. She wanted me to help her. And I said to her, look, I really don't know that area. And this was a really high, she wanted to live, move to Glencoe. That's, that's some big bucks. Uh, I was selling $70,000 condos. 
I said to her, I don't really know Glencoe. Let me refer you to an agent down there that can help you with this and you know, take care of it. Looking for a referral fee. And that's the acceptable, that's the right thing for me to do. Yes, I would like to have sold, I don't know what the prices were, half million dollar home. But I didn't know that area. I didn't know that marketplace. I didn't have the ins there to work with that. But she wanted me to. So I went down there a number of times to help her look at properties. And then one day she stopped returning my calls and I knew what was up. She had bought a home, right? So I finally got a hold of her and said, so what happened? What's going on? You bought a house, I assume. And she's like, well, I did. Just, you know, afraid to, to tell you. And I'm embarrassed to tell you. I said, okay, great. She bought a for sale by owner, which of course I could have helped her with, but we didn't get that far, right? Probably in my end of not coaching her well enough on how to work with for sale by owners. Um, she gave me a bottle of wine for my time. I'm sure it was a nice bottle of wine. I don't really drink wine. So a little insult to injury there. So just my little story about family and friends. Think about who you're going to work with, how you're going to work with them, what kind of business you want, and are you going to hook them up with the buyer's agency agreement? So buyer's agency agreement, think about using those. Are you going to, when you use those with a client, you need to ask every client about them. You can't just hit or miss, ask this one, but not that one. It's got to be a conversation for every buyer, buyer client uh, if they're interested in doing that. And have them sign it. If they don't sign it, I would, I would turn the form over and sign in the back of it, you know, fill in the information, have discussion, here's the date, here's the time, and I would write down here's the location. Just in case something ever comes back to you in the way of discrimination that you don't, they, you know, someone thinks you didn't do this with everybody, you've got proof that you really did ask everybody about it. Um, but buyer agency agreement. So I think of those as a loyalty commitment between you and the client. The client's agreeing to work with you and you are agreeing to work with them, providing them all the services they need for real estate 24 seven, seven days a week, 365. So if you plan to have a day off and you should, then you need to find a partner, another person, another agent in the office to take care of those clients' real estate needs when you are on your day off. And again, you are entitled to day off, but they should still have the real estate needs met. So buyer agency agreement, figure out what conversation you have with them. I'm not gonna tell you what to say about it, but what I will say is, Floyd Wickman would say, he's a national trainer who was, um, never sell with blah, blah, what you can sell with blah. And it took me a while to figure that out. What he's saying is don't oversell it. Don't say too much. Get comfortable with what you're saying to the client and then present it and get the response. And then my last sales tip as I wrap up here, use your pen. So this works really well in a listing agreement, but it can work well with the buyer too. You're discussing the buyer agency agreement. You want them to look at you, you raise the pen between your eyeballs. They'll follow the pen. You want them to look down, bring the pen down to the paper. As you look down, they will go down to the paper and read it as well. And you can go along with your pen and point to the words. Here's where it says what it is. Here's what's going on. Bring it back up. Their eyes will follow it back up. You have the conversation of, so are you ready to sign this? Go ahead and fill this out. And hand them the pen. They will take it from you. They will take the pen from you if you hand it to them. They may not sign it necessarily, but they, they can't help themselves to take it. Try it sometime. Just walk up to, you know, you're having a conversation, hand somebody the pen. They're going to take it from you. They, they, they cannot do that. Anything else, they have to take it. All right. And with that, I'm wrapping up. I don't know if there are any questions. I've been watching the chat box. Nothing exciting has been popping up in here. So with that, that is working with buyers. If you have any other questions, I welcome you to... Um, Put that in the chat box. I'm going to shut off the recording here. There we go. I think